morning. I don't know if anybody has heard anything about it or not, but uh, there's a a big football game going to be played later this evening that uh, is almost like a national holiday anymore uh, in in the United States. And uh, uh, I was reading somewhere that the very first Super Bowl uh, tickets were just a few dollars each. Of course, that was a long time ago, and they did not even sell out the stadium. Uh, and so nowadays, they're thousands of dollars a piece and uh, waiting lists of people trying to get in uh, to see this. So, uh, nonetheless, we're here this morning to hear from the Lord and to receive a word from God. I believe I have a, a word for us this morning that will be a challenge and an encouragement to you uh, today. In Paul's letters, <clears throat> He compares the Christian life to running a race a lot of times. And so that's why I've got the image I do on the screen, the running of a race. I'm sure glad that the race that Paul talks about is not the kind of race where you have to run fast because I hadn't ever been able to run really fast. And now that I'm uh, 50 and, uh, uh, you know, out of shape, I surely can't run very fast. So the competition is not to the fast, but to he or she that endures till the end. The one that presses through and endures to the end. This race of our faith requires endurance and perseverance and discipline. And folks, I want to tell you that those are the things that, uh, If you heard the message in tongues this morning, God has a table spread where he gives you what you need to run the race. You know, the endurance, the perseverance, all of those things are not your own, but they are supplied to you by the very God who says, run the race that is set before you with patience. And he says, and I'll supply your every need according to my riches in glory. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful thing that God has prepared for us. So I want to talk to you this morning. Uh, here in, in several hours, there's going to be a competition for a trophy that takes place out in Los Angeles uh, on a football field. And it'll have the world's attention. Uh, you know, one of the most viewed events on TV every year, the Super Bowl is going to be played. But folks, I want to tell you this morning, we are competing for something much more important than the Lombardi trophy and a, a ring that they'll place upon our fingers. We are competing this morning for a crown. And I'm here today to try to encourage you to try to just be your cheerleader this morning and to remind you about the importance of competing competing for the crown of life. Let's read the scripture from 1 Corinthians 9 this morning. Verse number 24 says, Do you know? Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. I haven't watched any of, of this uh, Winter Olympics that are going on right now, but I know enough of the Olympic competition that many of those races, many of those things have dozens of competitors from all over the world that are trying to to win. And they've trained many of them for years to get to that moment where they get to run that race. But yet only the top three get any kind. Number four doesn't get any mention at all. Third gets a bronze. Second gets a silver. First gets a gold, you know. and and, But there may be, you know, 20, 30 people competing for that in some of these races. Maybe more than that, and only the top three. That's, what, that's exactly what Paul is talking about in that verse. He's talking about when they have these games, when they have these Roman games, when they have these competitions, everybody runs, but only the winner gets to put the crown on. Only the winner gets to put the, 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 uh, the crown on his head at the end. But he's saying just because, just because of that Run that you may obtain the prize. Run that you may... That's what it says right there uh, in our scripture. Run to receive the prize. Every athlete, in verse 25, exercises self-control in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable wreath. That's the crown that I'm talking about. 
but we an imperishable. So do not run aimlessly. He says, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Folks, Paul, that is one of, of the, the most challenging passages of Scripture in the New Testament. It ought to challenge us. He says, we're running a race, every one of us, this race of faith. And God wants us to run to obtain the prize. We're in it. You've heard that old saying, right? We're in it to win it. Uh, we want to run to obtain the prize. Uh, a few years ago, uh, of course, I'm from Arkansas. Most of y'all all know that. We do have some visitors that may not be aware of that. But we, I've got, I'm from Arkansas. And several years ago, we had a football coach that came, and, uh, and, and he got Arkansas ranked in the top five, which doesn't happen very often in Arkansas. Anyway, they went down to play Louisiana State. Louisiana State was ranked, I think, maybe number one at the time. And he beat them down there in Baton Rouge in Death Valley. And after the game, they said, Coach, what do you think about that? Are you surprised that your team was able? able to do this and his his comment was well we didn't come here to paint <laughs> we came here to win the game we expected to win the game we didn't come to paint folks let me tell you something Jesus didn't save you so that you could fail he didn't save you so that you could live a life of lack and of misery but you have been saved to be an overcomer a winner a champion in the race of Christ but you have got to decide that I'm going to press ahead I'm going to run the race that is set before me I'm going to beat my body discipline on my body keep it under control so that I will not disqualify myself from the from the, the 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 championship of this race that comes that is awarded at the end by God once we accept Jesus we've got to run the race we begin competing and I'm not racing against you and you're not racing against me we all are simply running against uh, the, the flesh and against the devil against the enemy we're, we're running to be measured by the word of God and our gifts and our calling you see the world thinks of the race as everybody in all lanes are all competing against each other. But in this race, we are not competing one with another in the family of God. We are competing against the calling of the prize uh, that God, the prize of the high calling that God has placed out on our lives. We're competing against hell. We're competing against the devil. We're competing against the work of the enemy in our lives. And, we're, and we've got God's help to win this thing. James 1 and 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Paul says, run the race to finish the race and receive the crown. If these athletes will devote their entire being to running around a track and getting a, you know, in Paul's day, that was a, 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 a crown made out of leaves, laurel branches or whatever. It was, and it was perishable, just like he said. It wasn't a gold medal or a silver medal, but it was a, perishable crown he said if they'll push themselves and train just to get that those leaves placed upon their head how much more should we push ourselves to excellence in our walk with Christ so that we might obtain the crown that God has laid up for us and James says it like this when you persevere when you hang in the fight when you don't duck and run when you don't quit when you just hang in through the testing there is a crown that God has laid up for you for everyone who loves Loves the Lord to those who finish the race. You've just got to hang on. <laughs> just hold on, brothers and sisters. Just understand that we're in this competition and we can't quit early. We've got to press on. When do we get to quit? 
kind of like they say about wrestling a bear. You don't wrestle a bear until you get tired. <laughs> you wrestle the bear until he gets tired. <laughs> You've got to run this race not until you get ready to quit, but until God says, come on home, my child. There is a reward laid up for you and enter into the peace that God has made ready for you. To win this crown, to win this crown that Paul and James talk about, this crown of eternal life that God has laid up for us, I want you to understand some things. And I've already talked about point one a little bit. We're competing together. You are not alone in this race. You are not left by yourself to compete alone. This thing is a team effort. My three boys, all, well, one of them dabbled in sports a little bit. The other two played some football. Caleb stayed in all the way through his, his senior year of football. And one, of those, one of the things that you realize, a lot of times two teams are really equal in coaching. They're equal in talent on the field they're they're pretty equal in their you know in all aspects and the game comes down to just a few things does everybody do their job does everybody do their job you see the one time that the offensive lineman doesn't get his block is the time that there's a sack or a, a, a the play doesn't go the way it's supposed to the one time that you know, that, that the quarterback doesn't give us full effort is the one time that makes the difference in the game. The one time that the running back doesn't see the right block and cut through the right hole is the one time that makes the difference because everybody's got to do their thing. The one time on defense that the linebacker wasn't watching and, and the play went past him. You know what I'm saying? It takes everybody. Ten people on the, on the field can all be doing their job and one not doing his job and the play can be a disaster. I want to tell you, church, it's a whole lot like that in the body of Christ. We need to all be doing our... Pastor, don't talk about football. I don't care anything about football. Okay, well, you know, what in the church we all have our gift and our calling not a single one of us were called to sit and watch everybody else we're all whether this church has 30 people or 300 people should God bless us uh, with, with unprecedented growth everybody needs a part on the team and we all need to be working together because this thing can't just be run by the quarterback it can't just be run by one or two that are really trying hard and everybody else just standing there we've got, we've got to work together I used to sing when I was in booster band as a kid when we all pull together how happy we'll be folks we need to remember that as Christians as adult Christians in the body of Christ we can do so much more if everybody will do a little bit if everybody will pitch in and pull together on this thing called the church great teams understand that they need great teammates in order to make the journey. I, I, I know I'm going to talk about sports more today than some of y'all would like for me to, but probably one of the greatest professional basketball players that's ever lived, the team he's on right now is not very good. LeBron James and the Lakers, they're not very good right now. I don't pay much attention to the NBA, but I know they're not very good. There's teams that are a lot better. Why? These other teams have much better team work. They may have the single greatest player. I can remember once as a kid that the Lakers, when I was much younger, the Lakers tried to assemble the greatest cast of free agents they could assemble, and they got all these guys together, and they flopped as a team because they had a bunch of individual all-stars but no team chemistry. Church, I want to tell you, it won't matter if we have the greatest worship leader or the greatest preacher or the greatest board member or the greatest individual in the church, the greatest Sunday school teacher. We could bring in the greatest youth pastor, and it won't matter a whole lot if we don't all do our part in the body of Christ. Amen? If we don't all work together on this thing called the race of faith, it's not going to matter much. We need this team to succeed in order to compete for the crown that God wants to give to us as we finish our race. You see, it says this in Romans 8, 
Verse 13 says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption (laughs) as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. You see, we quote that, we talk about that a lot, but you see what the next word says? Provided we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified with him. What? Paul says, this is a great thing. We've been taken out of darkness and brought into the light. We who were not part of God's family have been adopted by God and given the right to call him Papa. You know, he says, Abba, Father, but it just means like Daddy. It's a, it's a term of endearment to show our nearness to God. It's not just a formal, oh, he is God Almighty, but we can call him Dad, our Heavenly Father. He loves us. And so he says, you've been brought into this relationship and there are many blessings for you if you live after the Spirit. But these things are laid up. You are a fellow heir with Christ Jesus. We quote that a lot. I hear Christian people saying, we're heirs and joint heirs. We can expect everything from God. But what about the next part of that verse that says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. I'm telling you, church, I have got to do my part. I've got it. And it's not all about what goes on on this platform. This is only a tiny part of what it means to serve God. We've got to serve him when we walk out these doors to live for Christ on our jobs, in our families, when we're having a day off, when we're shopping for groceries, whatever we're doing, that we are living our lives as part of the team of God. We can cry out, Father, God, but we've got a responsibility to the other members of the family. You can read Romans 8, 13 through 17. You can expand it. For several verses before that if you want to. I shortened it for the sake of of, of clarity and brevity today. But you can read that and you've got to understand that what he's saying there is I've got a responsibility to you. And you have a responsibility to me. We're responsible to Lord God, to Lord Jesus. But we are responsible one to another as members of the family. What I do affects you. And what you do affects me. And folks, when I come in church and I really worship, it affects you. It makes it easier for you to really worship. When I come into church and fold my arms and say, I'm not worshiping today, it affects the others around you and it makes it harder for them to worship. When I, when you Amen, the preacher. It makes it easier for others to amen. It makes it easier for the preacher to preach when you're paying attention and and all of those things. Yeah, yeah, that's about the worship service. But let me tell you something else. When you pray, when you read your Bible, when you fast, when you have a devotion time at home, when you love your life, uh, love your wife, and when you honor your husband, when you're doing all of those things as part of God's team, it makes it easier on the team to succeed. And when we're not doing our part, when we're not doing the things that we know we ought to do, it makes it harder on the team to succeed. The church Because we are not islands unto ourselves. We are a family of God that works together in this thing. And we can either build one another up and we can either, you know, work together to support one another. Not that any of us are supposed to be perfect because God knows we're not going to attain unto perfection. But the deal is that we are trying. The deal is that we are working towards a goal, that we're not satisfied with our shortcomings and our blemishes. There's areas of my spiritual life I'm still very definitely not happy with. But I'm not making excuses for them. I'm working on them, and I'm trying to improve in those areas so that God is glorified by my life and so that I can become the best version of myself that I can become in this life. 
for me, for my wife, for my son, for all of you, and for the lost out there who still haven't heard. But folks, that shouldn't just be my calling. That shouldn't just be my goal. It should be all of our goals to work so that our light may shine brightly, so that God's light may shine through us brightly. By our good works, others will give glory to God because they see us doing our part. You see, we compete together. That's why it's so important for you to be as involved as possible in the ministries of the church. Now, I'm not just talking about Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, but I'm talking about the ministries of the church. Whatever the church has going on, that we're as involved as we possibly can be in the giving, in the discipleship, in the children, in the outreach, whatever it is that we can do. I know not all of us can do everything, but we all need to be doing the best that we can. Can you agree with that? Are you still with me? You still... (laughs) <laughs> you're still flowing with me here we've got to realize that God did not call us to be solitary servants but to work in teamwork to work together in the cause of Christ let me move on I want you to realize and I once again all these points kind of bleed together and there are only three today but secondly I want you to realize that little things Make a big difference. First thing is, it's teamwork. We're all in this thing together. For me to succeed, I need you to succeed. For you to succeed, you need me to succeed. We need to work together as a team. Secondly, it's the little things that make the big difference. You see, folks, I would not doubt that when that big game is played later today, that it's one or two missed passes, one or two fumbles, one or two poorly timed penalties that could make the difference in who's the Super Bowl champion and and who's the, the loser of that game. Because they're both winning teams, they're both supremely talented. So it could just be one or two turnovers, one or two penalties, you know, one or two mistakes that make all the difference in who wins. It may not be the big things. It may not be the game plan. It may not be the the big things that make a difference, but just the little things. Can I tell you that the point of that is this? It is the little things in our life that really make the biggest difference. In our spiritual life, it's those little things that make the biggest difference difference in our lives there are little things we think of them as being mundane or or routine you see we all want the experience where the pastor preaches straight uh, glory down from heaven and we feel the hair on the back of our neck standing up and and we just can't decide whether we want to dance jump shout or 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 jericho march around the building we want to come to the altar have hands laid on us and instantly everything change and yes lord that can happen but let me me tell you most of the time in our Christian walk the difference between success and failure is the little things the mundane things that we either do them or we do not do them and they make all the difference you see one Christian walking in victory and it seems like God is just pouring out blessings on them and another who uh, you know who's just barely scraping by many times it is because the one that is walking in blessing has been taken taking care of the little things, the unseen things, the hidden things, and then God blesses that brother or that sister publicly. Sometimes the other one is just in a season of testing, and we go through those, every one of us, regardless of how faithful you are to the little things. But I'm talking about if you want a harvest of blessing, you got to plant the seeds for that harvest. you got to do the little things. These farmers around here, sometime soon, they're going to begin to to, to do the work to prepare those fields so they can plant all that corn again, (laughs) you know, so they get all those crops back in the field again. During the winter months when the snow is on the ground and it's too cold, the ground is frozen, they can't do the planting, they're working on their finances and they're working on their tractors and their equipment and they're getting everything ready because one day very soon they're going to be out there prepping those fields to receive the seed. And if they don't do the part of the wintertime work, they won't be ready for the springtime work, 
right? And if they don't do the springtime work, there sure won't be anything to do in the fall. So if we don't do the little things, what are the little things? I'm going to get there very quickly. But if we don't do the mundane things, the little things, I want the experience. Absolutely. I want, and I'm so thankful that I get the experience of a worship service that is followed by a message in tongues, that is followed by an interpretation, and that is followed by the, the reception of the, uh, of the Lord's table. Thank you, Lord, for that experience. I'm thankful that I can feel the love of God when we have a service like that. I'm thankful that I can experience the blessings of the Lord in my life. But folks, I want to walk from blessing to blessing, from glory to glory. I want this, t this church to be successful. And by successful, I mean I want to see souls being saved regularly. I want to see people being healed regularly. I want to see God's kingdom advancing, devils being defeated, miracles happening. I want to see God's will being done on a regular basis. And to get there, I've got some keys that I've got to do. And the first one of these mundane things, these little things that make a big difference, is your prayer life. You see... It's your prayers that activate your faith. Are you sure about that? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Absolutely. But if you're going to activate and release that faith, you've got to pray. Jesus said, pray in this manner. He told us to pray. There are many commands all through the New Testament that men and women of God need to be involved in prayer, to pray at all times, to pray about everything, to be people of prayer, yet Surveys of Christian people show that they spend mere minutes a day actually praying. And we wonder why the church in America has no power. We wonder why so many churches are cold and dead or dying. Folks, I want to tell you that we enjoy many blessings because the saints of God of yesterday prayed and we're enjoying their blessings today. But if we want to continue to see the blessing of God on Eastgate Assembly as, as his church here, we've got to do our part to, to be diligent to, about our prayer life. Nothing lasting nothing good goes on in the kingdom of God unless it is birthed through prayer God chooses to work through the prayers of his people and your spiritual life will go no further than your prayer life can you imagine these guys the, uh, Joe Burrow or, or uh, 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 you know any of these others that are going to be playing to get today who didn't start off long ago as a little kid learning the proper way to throw a football, how to put the shoulder pads on, how to put their cleats on. They had to learn those mundane little things. And then they had to learn how to block and how to, I don't want to block. I don't want to tackle. I want to be a quarterback. I, you got to learn how to block. You got to learn how to tackle. You got to learn how to run the play. Line up. Let's run it again. Everybody back in position. Get in line. Let's run it again. Come on. Come on. Let's run. We've already run that play 15 times, but we got to run it again until we get it right. Line up. Let's go. What? It's the mundane things. I'm telling you that you can't ever pray too much. You got to keep getting in the trenches and talk. But I don't want to pray. I want to lead somebody to Christ. I want to lay my hands on a sick person and they get healed. I want to command a devil to leave and he's got to flee. You got to get in your prayer closet and spend some time talking to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and just simply doing the little things. Doing the small things. If you want to see the big victories, you got to do the small, mundane things that go on behind the scenes. You don't get big things if you're not doing the little things. Your prayer life is key to the victory. If you want more out of your spiritual life than what you're currently experiencing, crank up your personal prayer life. You don't have to switch churches. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, find a better preacher. You don't have to go run to a big revival somewhere. You, for the most part, need to just, like me, crank up your prayer life, uh, personally speaking, and you will begin to experience uh, more of a difference in your spiritual life from that one little change than from just about anything else you can do. I don't believe that pastor will try me on it. Try me on it and see if I'm telling you the truth because I promise you that I am. Secondly, your devotional life. 
Well, what do you mean? You just said prayer life. Isn't that devotions? Devotional life is taking the Word of God and digging deeply into it. Asking the Holy Spirit to speak to you from the, God's Word. Meditating and thinking about just one Scripture or just a passage of Scripture. Digging into it deeply and thinking and meditating on it and, and saying, how does this apply to me? And what did it originally mean? And what did it mean to the first audience that heard it? And, and what does it mean to me today? And how can this help me be a better Christian? Digging in, spending time meditating and thinking about the Word of God. Being devotional also means that we just, we've prayed and we've read the Word and now we're just going to be quiet. And just let God have a chance to speak. I'm having a little devotion time. I'm going to let the Lord just speak. We Pentecostals don't like quiet. We like loud. <laughs> We're much more comfortable with loud than we are with quiet. But in your devotional time, take a moment to just be quiet and listen for the voice of the Lord. Many times He doesn't speak through the loudness. It's in the still quietness that you'll hear the voice of the Lord. Devotion time may also include your just times of giving praise to God. Lord, I just want to thank you for being God. Praise is praising God just for who he is. It's not asking him for anything. Thank you that you're God and that I'm not, that you're the healer, that you're eternal, that you're all-powerful and all-knowing and everywhere present. And Any promises that you can think of from the book, that's in our devotion time, devoting ourselves to the Lord just not this isn't intercessory prayer time this isn't where we're praying God make pastor a better preacher <laughs> this isn't where we're praying oh God please make my boss a better boss or please give me a better job but we're praying we're just devoting ourselves to our love for the Lord devoting ourselves to his word listening for his commands giving thanks and praise unto God just you see, I'm telling you, many people who say, I never hear from God, God never speaks to me, I find out that they aren't spending any time devotionally trying to talk to God at all. Their prayer is something like, Oh, dear God, you know I hate my job and I need you today and please help me. I'm about to go in here again. Don't let me kill anybody. <laughs> and that's about the extent of their prayer life, you know. Oh, God, you got to help me. An and excited utterance. Is about the extent of their prayer life. You got to get in the Word. You got to devote some time if you want to hear from God. All right, let, let me move on. I know y'all are being great. Can I tell you that there's another thing that, that is really important? And, and I know it's fallen out of favor today, but, but your church attendance is, is, is really important to the victory of the team. We can't win together if we don't meet together. You know, uh, it would be something to try to see a. Uh, uh, any of y'all watch many sports during the, the pandemic? I, I hate watching basketball on TV when the commentators aren't there because they just, they get, anyway, they make mistakes and they can't see everything and they don't know what's going on and you're watching something happening and they're not even talking about it because they're not there in the arena. But could you imagine them trying to play the Super Bowl if, if all of the Rams didn't show up at, at SoFi Stadium and they only had, you know, well, um, we've got a center and a quarterback, a tackle and one receiver and we're going to play it. Ridiculous, you know. Everybody's got to show up. Eastgate needs you. Eastgate needs every one of you, and we need those that God is going to add, but you are not insignificant. Don't let the devil make you think that your part doesn't matter because your part encourages. Your part lifts up. Your part makes a difference. God has you here because your part is important here. Whether you ever sing a song or preach a message or teach a class, that doesn't matter as much as the fact that you are part of the Eastgate team. And you are important. Your presence and your, uh, your encouragement and your love for the family. We are definitely better together. Number four, your witness makes a difference. Now what have I said? The little things. The keys to victory. Your prayer life. Your devotional time. Your church attendance. And your witnessing. Oh, pastor, you could have talked all day and not had to talk about witnessing. We don't like to talk about witnessing. But it's important to the success of the team. 
The reason, folks, is this. God's plan for your life starts with your willingness to share the good news with other people. What? You mean God's plan for my life doesn't include me coming to church, you know, on Sunday? (laughs) Well, that's a small part of it. But Jesus didn't say in Acts 1 and 8, tarry ye here in Jerusalem until you're endued with power, and after that you'll have the best church services that the world has ever seen. (laughs) Right? He didn't say wait until the Holy Ghost comes, and then you go out into the whole world and have good potlucks. (laughs) Although church cooks are the best cooks in the world, I do believe. But, but he, he said, I'm going to give you power. Now listen to me, church. He said, I'm going to give you power in just a few days. There's a gift of power that's going to come. And this power will enable you to be what? Witnesses. To be my witnesses. Church We're not going to be the success that God, we can have prayer meetings and we can have worship services and we can have preaching. We can have all of those things, but we'll never be the success. You know what happens? We we, we become a bless me club. We we become a club, a, a group, a meeting where we just get together and keep blessing what's left until there's nothing left because we're not doing the work of an evangelist. We're not doing the work of witnessing that the church was born to do. It's right there in Acts 1 and 8. Ye shall be my witnesses starting here in Jerusalem and then into Judea and then into Samaria and then unto the uttermost. Church, we're not coming just so that I can check off a box on my to-do list that makes me feel better about my uh, devotion to God. What we're doing is we are coming to praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and then to prepare ourselves to go out into a world and witness to a Muslim or to an atheist or to an agnostic or to a Wiccan or to a whatever they may be that are out there in this world. That's, That's what we're gathered together for. That's why God pours his spirit out upon his people what did I say earlier we can have preaching and we can have worship and we can have prayer but if we don't have witnessing the church will eventually die because we're all not going to be here forever God will move people to a different place for a job or, or, or God will promote folks to heaven or Things will happen in life, and if we're not witnessing, if we're not witnessing, there's no new life coming in, and eventually the old passes away for one one aspect or another. Life, the one thing that's true about life is it changes. And so you're never going to have, right, Uh, you're never going to have everything be exactly the same. So we've got to be at our work, and that is where God moves. That is where God shows up with power. That is where God blesses is when we're involved in doing what the Holy Spirit is doing. And the Holy Spirit is our power to witness. Doesn't mean we got to make a sign and stand on the street corner, you know. Doesn't mean we got to put on a, what do they call those things, a sandwich board and go march up and down the street. But it does mean that we need to live our lives as a witness for Jesus Christ. You see, we play for each other. And the little things, your prayer life, your devotion time, your witnessing. Well, we hired a pastor. He's supposed to do all of that. I'm supposed to do my part. But so is everybody else. You're part of the prayer work. You're part of the devotion. You're part of the witnessing. We've all got to do our part if we're going to see the church be a success, this church or any other. And finally, let me close out today by saying we are competing, folks, for a crown. We're competing for a crown. As followers of Jesus, we have a huge prize that we're competing for. James 1 and 12 said, blessed is the man who is steadfast under trial. We're going to have trials. Things aren't going to go our way. We're going to get sick. We're going to lose jobs. We're going to have people mad at us. Whatever you can think of, we're going to have trials. The enemy's going to come in with discouragement and depression and try to confuse us and defeat us and cause us to, to quit. You know, if he can just get the church to quit praying and quit reading their Bible and quit witnessing, well, he may not be able to get to our souls, but he can keep us from reaching anybody else. 
So we've got to continue to do our part, continue to run the race. James says, when you stand the test, you'll receive the crown. (laughs) When you stand the test, you'll receive the crown that God has prepared for those who love him. Folks, this eternal life that God has promised us is worth anything we may have to endure in this life. Paul could say, I've been through some stuff, (laughs) but I count all of these things that I've gone through as light and momentary afflictions in light of the glory that is set before me. Now, you're talking about a guy that had been shipwrecked and beaten and had, you know, put in jail and all kinds of things that you and I would think are huge sacrifices. He'd had these things done, and, 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 and in your Bible, he calls them a light momentary affliction. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, no matter, some of you have endured great things in this life. You've lost loved ones. You've had uh, 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 friendships broken up. You've been ridiculed. You've had health difficulties, whatever it may be. You've gone through some stuff. But folks, let me tell you, there's nothing we go through in this life that is going to make us regret having served God when we get to glory when we see what God is really going to bless with we won't regret one thing there's a, a, an old song that they uh, a group used to sing said I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now I gotta make it to heaven somehow I wouldn't take anything for this journey. Man, I'd like to go back and redo some choices that I made. But as far as regretting the journey, I don't regret the journey. It's been some bad times, but many good times. And I know that regardless, what is still ahead of me is greater than anything that I might have to lay aside in this life and give up for the cause of Christ. You see, we have each other. I don't know what I have, Pastor, that makes this bearable. We have each other here at Eastgate. We have one another. We have this family, this local family. Then I promise you, we have an extended family of faith that stretches out beyond the walls of Eastgate. All of us could make calls if we needed to this afternoon to other Christians that meet at other churches, and we could have other churches all around the world praying within just a few hours of, of a prayer request going out. We've got this family. They may have never met you, but they'll touch God for you. They'll go to the Lord for you if they're asked to. We've proven it, haven't we, time and again, that that benefit of, of being in the family of God. But folks, even above that, let's just say for some instance that you couldn't get a hold of any human being to pray for you or to help you. Well, that's all right because you've got God, the Holy Spirit, who is always with you and will never leave you nor forsake you. And so even if your phone won't work and you can't call somebody to help you, if you're all alone and can't get a hold of anybody, you've got God, the Holy Spirit right there and you can just say, Lord, right now, right now I need your help and the Holy Spirit of the living God will began working in you and through you. Can I just tell you that God the Holy Spirit is able to alert people and to call people and to speak to people for you even when you can't. I don't even know what to pray. Well, the Holy Spirit groans and makes utterance for us when we don't know what to pray. All I know how to do is cry. Well, cry because tears are a language that the Holy Spirit understands and can translate into your prayer life. I'm telling you, even times When we don't know what to do, God the Holy Spirit is there with us to help us through those things. These are the benefits that come from being in the family of God. I could go on and on, but I won't. The benefits that come from being part of this team that is competing for a crown. What I'm trying to tell you is, church, I don't want to just go through the motions. I don't want to just have service because it's Sunday, right? I don't want to have service because it's Wednesday. Well, that's what I'm being paid to do. We need to have church. I don't want to have service just because it's a religious obligation that, well, on Sunday, I was raised that you go to church on Sunday morning. I want it to be so far beyond just an obligation that we do. I want to realize that in coming together, in worshiping, in praying, in preaching, we are competing for the souls of our friends, our sons, our daughters, our neighbors, this very community. We are playing together 
together. This is when we come into our, uh, if you will, to use one last football analogy, we're coming into our huddle to hear from the head coach who's calling the plays. And in just about two minutes, we're going to dismiss and we're going to be headed back out these doors to run the play that God has called for your life. We need our huddles to come together because we... Folks, this isn't a game. There are souls that are in the balance out there in our lives. I've got two boys that need to, to, to be saved that are out there in this world. You've got family members that need Jesus. We've got a whole community around here of people that are lost. And should Jesus come back today, they would be going to hell. And we, we are the light that is set on the hillside that needs to be doing our part to get the gospel message to them before it's too late. You made the choice today to be here. You've come, you've entered into this place, you've sat patiently through this sermon this morning, so I want to ask you a few questions. Have you, it's a Sunday morning, I realize it's most of the same faces that I see every Sunday morning, but I've got to ask you this question. Have you made the choice to follow Jesus and to run the race of faith? Have you made that choice? Is Jesus your Savior? Have you? Well, I've been coming to church forever. I started coming to church when I was just a baby and I've never quit. But have you made the choice? Have you made the personal choice to follow Jesus as your Savior? It's not enough to just come to church. Not enough to just give in an offering. We must personally choose to ask Jesus to save us from our sins, and to be our Savior and our Lord. If you haven't done that, you need to do so today before you leave this room. And we can make that happen very quickly and very easily. Let me ask you this. Have you qualified for the crown of life by asking Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior? Then if you have, are you doing the little things? that make the biggest difference in your spiritual life? Where do you stand in your prayer life? Where do you stand in your devotional life? Where do you stand in your church attendance? Are you doing the best that you can? Where do you stand in your giving? Where do you stand in your, uh, in your witnessing? Folks, God isn't asking for you to measure up with anybody else. He's just asking you for, for you to do the best that you can do. What is your best effort? You know, in reading through the Bible every year, I just went through the, uh, the part there in, uh, in the Old Testament where he's talking about the acceptable sacrifices. And he says, don't be bringing as a sacrifice anything that's not your best animal. Don't bring me your old sick, broke down animals. I, I won't accept it. But when you select an animal for a sacrifice, it needs to be spotless and without blemish. What? Folks, God doesn't want our garbage he wants the best that we have to offer whatever your best is doesn't matter if it matches up with my best because God knows the intent of your heart are you giving God the best of your prayer of your devotion of your attendance of your giving of your witnessing are you giving God your best I know that I have area to improve probably everybody in the room can say the same thing so my last question is will you make your stand and make your choice today to step up and compete for the crown a little harder than you have in the past. Compete for the crown of life a little harder. Compete for the souls of, of the lost a little harder. Just to, to do a little more than what you've been doing. Just to surrender your life a little more fully to the Holy Spirit's use in this year than what you've done before. Heavenly Father, I ask now, God, as we dismiss from the preaching of the Word that you would touch our hearts and lives today, God, that you would minister as only you can, that you would take my words, Lord, which seem to be, uh, Lord, frail and, and faulty today, and that you would make them to be anointed by your Holy Spirit to reach into the souls and the heart of men in ways that I cannot. Lord, that you would challenge and encourage every one of us today that we all know we can be involved in prayer more. We all know we can spend more devotional time. God, we know that we can give a little more 
And God, I certainly know that we can witness more. Lord, help us, strengthen us, and let us rely on our team. Let us rely on our gift comforter, the Holy Ghost that is within us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you stand with me for a moment of invitation before you go? I ask if there's anybody that needs to follow Christ and make that decision to, to get on the winning team today. And so I want to give you that chance. If you said, Pastor, no, I haven't made that personal choice. I've not called out on Jesus to be my personal Savior. Would, would you just step out from where you are and come to the altar right now? I don't want you to go home and still be... Uh, and still be on the other team. I want you to come and, and join the winning team today by accepting Christ Jesus as your Savior and your Lord this morning. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to ask you today, as I always do, we're a, a Pentecostal church and we believe in, in, in the God of miracles. And so if you need a touch from the Lord in your life or anything this morning before you go home, you can just make your way to the altar as I pray a prayer of, uh, of dismissal. You can make your way to the altar. I will pray with you once I have uh, dismissed the church. And uh, we'll just believe together for God to do great things. Amen. Amen. So some of you brothers and sisters that don't have to leave immediately, if you would come to the altar as a, as a prayer partner for those that are already up here, I would appreciate your help. I'm going to pray. We will, have, we will have service tonight at 6 o'clock for those of you that are able to come back. Heavenly Father, I ask right now that you touch these men and women that are in the altar and prepare them to receive your miracle. But Lord God, right now, speak to every heart and every life, Lord, that as we go from here, we realize that we are playing for the winning team and that we are competing for a prize of eternal life, that the things that we do, they make a big difference. So we pray, God, right now for your help to be victorious in our spiritual life. In Jesus' name, amen.